now we'd like to present you talking about commercialization as service providers roundtable, the representatives of ESA's commercial service providers. So here ESA takes a different role, one of the enabler of innovation, as Bernard just said, while the industry takes the full lead of the project it intends to develop. And we're going to discuss this today with the commercial partnership, how the mechanism supports companies in sharing the risk. Just as Bernard said, uh, similar innovation products that cannot be developed and tested on Earth and that often have a very high level of failure. So please welcome to the stage quite a few guests, hence the number of chairs. We've got uh, Nelly Offord from the Lunar Pathfinder mission, Business Line Manager, Exploration at Surrey Satellite Technology Limited. Welcome to Nelly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nelly. We've got Hilde Steinaut, uh, Ice Cubes Facilities, Business Development Space Application Services. Hilde, to the stage. <laughs> Christian Stimmle, who is from Bartolomeo Platform, Program Manager, Airbus Defense and Space. Welcome to Christian. And then we've got David Zulesi, Bioreactor Express, Manager, Managing Director, Kaiser Space Limited. David. <laughs> and Joshua Western from Spaceforge, CEO and co founder. Joshua. <laughs> Daniel Campbell, who is from Space Pharma, managing director of Space Pharma. Daniel. And finally, we have Christian Prudrek, Yuri, co founder and chief operating officer of Yuri. <laughs> Welcome. So a very full panel, and uh, first off, I would like you all, starting right over there, you Nelly, tell us a little bit about the Lunar Pathfinder mission. So Lunar Pathfinder is um, a service provision for communication around the moon, so very relevant to uh, looking into the application that is going to be fostered through this service. Uh, it is a data relay satellite, it's a pioneer. A uh, data relay satellite that's going to offer commercial services for communication around the moon. It's a proof of concept, um, as, uh, as much technology as business-wise. Thank you very much. Hilda, a little bit about IceCube's business development. Sure. So IceCube's is a service that we provide um, to any entity that wants to do research or test technologies or do capacity building or educational projects making advantage of the unique environment, in particular on the space station where we have a facility, um, the environment of microgravity, of radiation uh, in general, of, of space. Um, and the, the facility uh, allows for modular and multi-user um, usage of this environment for a whole range of uh, research, uh, R&D, applied uh, R&D in the sectors that were touched upon already. Uh, so. Thank you, Hilde. Uh, Christian, uh, the Bartolomeo platform? Yeah, but the Bartolomeo all-in-one uh, space mission service offers access to our customers to the outside of the International Space Station. Our Bartolomeo platform is uh, installed on the European Columbus module, just in front of the station, very prominently, and uh, thereby you can start using ISS as a, like a satellite bus, and we offer end-to-end -end all the in, uh, services that are required to conduct the mission. Thank you. And uh, David, tell us about the Bioreactor Express. Yeah, so essentially Bioreactor Express is uh, uh, an initiative that um, we had together with ESA to use the Cubic on board the International Space Station, which is an incubator uh, inside Columbus. Uh, and then you can have uh, a experiment inside this incubator by means of pre-developed hardware or bespoke hardware. And then we can offer a turnkey services to every single uh, companies or institution they want to have their experiment on board on a fast track and with uh, some results in some very small uh, time compared to what it, it was uh, a space uh, program before. 
Thank you. And moving to Joshua, uh, you're going to tell us about Space Forge. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, feeling somewhat special with the handheld mic. Um, hopefully, it's not a comment <laughs> on the size of my head. Um, so, pleasure to be with you all. My name's Josh, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Space Forge. Space Forge is an in-space manufacturing company, and we're building the world's first fully returnable and relaunchable satellite platform, the Forge Star. The reason we're doing this is to access the space environment to leverage its unique benefits, which certainly I think this audience is all familiar with, in order to create materials that are simply impossible to manufacture on Earth. The way that our platform then returns, I like to describe as Mary Poppins from space. Uh, at this stage, I can tell you it's not ablative, uh, and much more information will be shared later this year ahead of our first launch, uh, which is eight to 12-ish weeks away. <laughs> Thank you. We'll, we'll all be glued. <laughs> Space Pharma, Daniel. So Space Pharma provides end-to-end -end services for life science and material science uh, researchers um, on board our miniaturized, remotely controlled labs, um, on board the International Space Station, but most importantly, outside the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, last but not least, Christian, you're going to talk about Yuri. Yes, so I'm Chris, co-founder of Yuri. Uh, we just turned three years, and uh, we are now more than 30 Yuri nodes um, in our company. Very proud of that, and with a clear mission to engineer end-to-end -end service solutions to provide biotech products formed in space. And that not only for our customers, so we're also doing lab as a service, so we have a standardized portfolio of like mini labs, which are compatible, for example, to, to ice school facilities but, or, and uh, cubic, but also to a lot of other facilities. We are already preparing for future and post-ISS missions, so we're currently developing in our Luxembourg office a facility, incubation facility called Science Taxi, which, uh, which uh, has a maiden flight early 2024. But we're also investing in our own research. So this is 10 out of our 30 people right now are scientists. We're building up a biolabs in infrastructure in a very modern um, lab in Barcelona, and we are flying our own research mission, only own funded um, in autumn already. So this is really, we are a service provider, but we are convinced that microgravity really will leverage new products, and this is why we invest heavily also in our own research and our own product development. So we provide service to customers, but we are also our own customer itself. Now, I'm going to go right back to you, Nelly, actually, and I'm going to ask you about something we've been talking about uh, all morning, really, the ESA-initiated demand stimulation activities. So ESA's role in this and uh, the collaboration that you've had and built up um, with the Surrey Satellite Technology that you're with. So tell us about that collaboration. Sure. Um, going back to what Bernard was explaining in the previous interview, um, SSTL and ESA have worked together very closely in a, in a commercial partnership, otherwise called PPP, previously. Um, and the role of ESA in that is to be the anchor customer, anchor tenant uh, for the service that we are going to provide. Um, it's allowing two things. First of all, it's allowing us, industry, to have the confidence that there will be a minimum um, market uptake that we can build a business case on and argue it to the shareholders. Second, it's a, it's a, it's a mark of confidence, it's a mark of trust, it's a collaboration with a, an institution who knows what they're doing, that, that enables other institutions and commercial companies to, to take up the service. So ESA's role in that was already extremely important. In addition to that, uh, ESA has, uh, has extended the collaboration to NASA, so ESA and NASA have uh, created a, a collaboration around uh, the Lunar Pathfinder services, which enables us not only to be launched by NASA, which is uh, fundamental to the success of the project, but also to broaden the, uh, the, the, the customer base. Mm -hmm. And turning to, to you, actually, Daniel, we heard from Marie-Laure about Medes and all of the work that they're doing. I don't know if with Space Pharma you have any connection to what Marie-Laure was saying, and again, that, that, that help from ESA, that hand-in-hand -hand collaboration. Well, obviously, aside of uh, being funded by private investors, we are um, also um, enjoying grants um, and also the support of um, you know, local agency. I'm based in London and you know, working with the Catapult and others. So I think that, in a sense, it's 
um, a certification or a stamp that you get for working with, with that entities, and then um, we can go to our customer and say, look, we are um, cooperating and partnering with all the right stakeholders to bring your mission um, all the way to a successful um, operation and execution. So it's really that stamp of approval that you get when you have ESA, uh, ESA as a hand-in-hand -hand partner. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit then, uh, Hilda, I'm going to turn to you about the experience in marketing your service. Yes, um, so I, I agree with everything what was being said in terms of um, yeah, the different, how ESA, how we work together with ESA in this, in this partnership. Um, in terms of marketing the service, what we see is that there's actually different, what I would say, sub-markets. Um, and they all have their own uh, pace, their own nature. Uh, we're both talking to academics, but also to pharmaceutical companies, to material companies. So each come with their own um, language, their own uh, approach, their own pace. Um, so for us, what we see is that it's very important to uh, very dynamically change gears uh, in terms of how we market, how we do that, how we approach and try to penetrate, for example, a pharmaceutical market, which is very different than uh, talking, for example, on a capacity building project uh, with a new emerging country. It's completely different how you, how you market and how you approach that. And what we see now is that um, to stay in the, in the climate and the nature uh, scene, let's say, that we see that there's um, green shoots coming, uh, so that it, it's emerging. Um, but we think it's very important at this point um, not to say, OK, it's green, we can harvest, we can leave the garden alone. No, now is the time to really, um, and for me, that's really important also with the accelerators, for example, with the case um, that this is now surrounded, that this is supported, that this is protected so that it can really grow and that we're not just growing the shoots that we're see seeing now, but that we're really growing a full-fledged garden with all the different types of plants but also bushes, trees, and so that it can grow. So that's, I think, where, for me, we are uh, with our marketing and, and the market in general. That's a wonderful analogy there with the garden. And David, there were lots of nods from you on that. Do you think a market exists or it's growing, it's, it's flourishing, it's blooming? <laughs> uh, yes, I think the market is growing. It's not still there, uh, but it's growing. Also, thanks to uh, the initiatives that are now uh, ongoing with ESA. Um, as Hilde mentioned, there are a variety uh, of different players who can uh, try to access the new uh, commercial way to space. Um, it has to be our role also to talk together uh, with uh, this new customer that will come in, uh, with their own languages. And yes, this should be difficult, but uh, also due to the roots that we have, uh, we can build and have some fruit <laughs> in the future. Uh, so starting from what we did in the past, uh, I saw a piece of art that we released in 1995, just in the back. Uh, so starting from the root, we try to build up a new future uh, with this new commercial uh, way to access space. And uh, Christian, I want to turn to you to talk about the collaboration with the BSGN accelerators in any form. How has that been for you? Um, a good question because we are, I think, one of, um, uh, of this round here, which does not have a private-public partnership. So that means we are not really using intensely this network, which is on the other side a little bit sad because, of course, they get great support because they get ESA calls and, you know, call for ideas for their facilities, uh, which we do not get, even if we are listed as a service provider. So this might be a discussion worth um, to maybe change this because, we, of course, we are also a European service provider. But in principle, we are happy about everyone who is trying to make the huge potential of microgravity research, like transparent. And um, the thing is maybe that we have to encourage ESA also to go really to the customer groups we are, we are aiming for. 
So really to present such possibilities of this accelerator and case and possibilities really to pharmaceutical industries. And I think it's, it's a small community which are aware and they, they are knowing the, the call for ideas from the ESA platforms, but not really the, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, for example, they are not aware of that one. So maybe <coughs> just as example, there's the ELGRA conference, the European Low Gravity Association, Research Association conference. They have a call online about new Shepard and suborbital flights, but there's no, no like, um, call from, from either side about microgravity. So something that we go really to the community and to the people which would be the end users would be great, or having the call in Cell or Nature magazines to really inspire other people which are anyhow not aware currently of, of these possibilities. So this is something maybe we, we could improve and again, we are happy of all initiatives ESA is taking, but we really have to sit together to learn together and maybe to, to foster our lessons learned to how we can attract really and aiming for the, the, the user groups we are, we are needing to really increase the market size and yeah, to get the, the thing rolling. That's really interesting and that's precisely where we're here, not to clap ourselves on the back, but to see where the gaps are and to see what needs to be done and what conversations need to be had and encouraged and fostered. So thank you for that. Turning to our other Christian, again, your thoughts on this. <laughs> um, your thoughts on the, the collaboration with the BSG and accelerators. Uh, yeah, it is there. <laughs> I must uh, say it is very, uh, very helpful, but not in a direct sense. Um, it's a, probably an awkward message, but we are... We, awkward is product, good. Let's call it a, use, a useful, positive yeah. <laughs> criticism. <maybe>. So there <laughs> is... <laughs> no, it's not at all meant as a criticism. The, um, so Bartolomeo is a, is a product that is kind of different from the other ones. Our, our challenge is usually that the budgets, available budgets at, at startup level, are too small. And the other ones are yeah, primarily institutional, uh, and, the, and the commercial market is, is growing, is building. But then to access this high-end, this larger size uh, budget market is uh, very difficult. And the, and the BSGN is very focused on the startup level and, and commercialize uh, bottom-up, if you will. And we, we are benefiting indirectly from that, because the more market grows, the, the more capital is in the mix, and the more uh, confidence into the system ISS is there. And uh, actually, it is, it is really growing, that confidence. We are signing contracts as we speak, although we have the Russian crisis and the future of ISS is not secure, but they sign up because they trust. And it's this kind of trust that is conveyed to the community broadband. That's, that's the big advantage for us. Yeah, it sounds like there's a gap in the middle between the, the money that's available right there at the, the seed level and then the scale up. There seems to be. Yeah, a but it will, will come. It, it just takes time. And if you have, it, if ISS, and that was Nanorex's main message always, and they were the kind of the pathfinder business case for all of that, they, they said it needs to be a common place where you invest money, where you make business. And the more common place it is, the more uh, risky the missions can be that are commercial and all that. It, it, it grows bottom up, but it takes time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Joshua, turning to you, is your business case closing? I think uh, our investors would certainly hope so. Um, so to date, we've raised 8.2 million pounds in, in private funding. Uh, I don't think we would have achieved that without the revenue and customer success that we've already had. I, I think where it is really closing uh, is uh, kind of to, to echo what Christian was saying around some of the opportunities with developing our own IP. How does space become, for, for us as Spaceforge, become really a cornerstone of terrestrial industry? What are the processes and the research that you can conduct, first at a pathfinder level, but then sustainably scale so that you can be adopted into everybody else's supply chains and development cycles on the ground? whether or not that's advanced materials or biotech or pharma or whatever it might be. But that, I think, is important. And for the way for that business case to close, it means act actively avoiding going to the International Space Station. It's not built for the capacity and the scale we need to adopt for true in-space manufacturing, true repeatable uh, in-space microgravity research. And that's where us with our return offering on a platform that goes to a higher, pure orbit than is currently accessible 
by station, uh, by the International Space Station, and, any, and at the moment, any of the future ones also coming online means that we can offer that. And the same question to you, actually, with your business case. Well, um, my background is partially from the automotive industry, and if you would l like to compare um, to a car... So just, you, you jumped from the automotive industry to pharma, space yeah. pharma. Uh, well, before that, I don't know, but in general, if you will ask the, auto the automotive OEM if a car has a closed business case, they will say no because they are not funding the infrastructure, they are not funding the roads, etc. And we have to go to our customer and say, it's not only that your ROI should be justified, we need to add the launch cost and everything else. And I think that we need to work together, and that's where you know, agencies and other can, can contribute um, to make sure that the infrastructure is there, that, and then application can arrive. Because, again, sometimes, private company tend to um, you know, whine about, oh, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough support. That's our duty to raise the funding. But we need the infrastructure and we need the um, legitimacy to conduct our business in a way that our business um, case would eventually be closed. And Hilda, do you come in? Yes. Yeah, can I just add something to that? Because I think it's a very valid point that Daniel is bringing that often when we talk in, in, um, in space and utilization of the space as assets for R&D, if we talk in terms of uh, time schedule and in terms of return on investment, we do a funny exercise, but because we include basically the infrastructure build-up time. If you ask a pharmaceutical their return on investment on a certain research or a certain vaccine, they will not tell you how long it took to set up their lab to build their lab, how much it costs, that they will not be considering in that calculation of return on investment and, and the time. So I think it's a very uh, relevant point that Daniel made. Th that is a very interesting point, actually. Would anyone else like to talk about their journey to the business case coming to a close or closing? Anyone else got an interesting point there that they'd like to discuss with the audience? As an example, as a case study, you're all smiles, Christian. <laughs> well, yes, at least we can, we can contribute a little bit without revealing too much. <laughs> but uh, it's, I think key is to come away from the theoretical model at the beginning, because as soon as the business plan hits reality, it's destroyed I immediately. Day one, you realize it is different than you expected. And Bartolomeo was built upon a market study, very theoretical, and a parametric model behind. And that parametric model and that scaling, and, and we want huge, and we need order intake in such a... And then it, it's, there's a market uptake. It's all theory, because when the, the reality comes in, you realize that you're not selling washing machines, and you are not, you're nobody, you are not trusted, and you, it takes time to build that all up in order to make people invest millions into your service. So we learned quite a deal, uh, uh, um, quite a lot with that, and also then ca came away from this, what I call the sales machine story. I have a product and I go out and uh, people are selling this worldwide, this was the, the, uh, the model, uh, to more dedicated uh, identification of budgets. If there is a budget, we go for it. If there's no budget, there's no, there's no, um, uh, there's not enough resources to do. It's, it's kind of an arrogant statement, but if, if we are only a few people, although we are big Airbus, we are only a few, few people in the mix, and we had to identify the concrete leads that we can follow up, and that's a dedicated a business development at the end. It's not yet a sell. It is a year, sometimes years, of bringing up a lead to a certain budget. And it, it doesn't matter whether it's commercial or institutional budget, a customer is a customer. And it takes time. That's very interesting. <coughs> Would you like to share with our audience how you find those leads? Yeah, well, you have to be very... <laughs> in Airbus, we call it customer intimacy. I find it embarrassing, that word. <laughs> but it's... But it's you, you have to understand where you are, what you're doing, what the others are doing, and who wants to do what. And unfortunately, uh, the marketplace it's not a free market as we, we have in other sectors where we can export, import from China or something. It's very much uh, regulated and very nationalistic at the end. And we tried, and, and we are now successful with that, to be in the US, because US is, is a very big marketplace. And this export 
uh, export uh, intention was very much supported by ESA. Not the way that they realized it, but there were certain exchanges of opportunities that American companies have in Europe and European companies have in the US, and out of a sudden it worked. And this kind of deal is required, so it, there's a mix. It's a regulated, institutional-based marketplace still, where we have to understand uh, um, the rules. It's not purely commercial, and that's why I'm saying a customer is an institutional customer as well as a private or whatever customer. Yeah? They are all alike, and they are good for us, and th that's commercial. David, I think you want yeah, to add. Yeah, I, I want to add something to what uh, Christian said right now. Uh, is it true that there's still a gap uh, between the European market and the US market? Not only in terms of customers, but also in terms of the support that the service provider had in the past in the US compared to what we have uh, here in Europe. So of course this uh, gives the US uh, service provider uh, a better position into the global market. Um, so we, we, we think that with this kind of initiative, uh, Europe can try uh, as an entity <laughs> to, uh, to face this uh, competition. Uh, and of course, we believe that uh, we have in Europe some very good companies uh, that can potentially uh, play a key role in, in, the, uh, in the global mm -hmm. market. So, uh, but there's still a gap. Yeah, that's a I, very honest, and I think, Christian, yeah, you want to add here. <laughs> exactly, what the just, I think the most important thing for really that we get business cases closed is really that we need successful use cases, that we need success stories, and especially this is also, I think, um, the duty of us startups, because we are investor cases, so we are bringing seed, seed money in, we're bringing Series A money in, but for that, that we can re really raise significant Series A um, rounds is that we need data, use cases, success stories, but not on basic research, but really on product development. And this is why I think also in the US, there are now coming startups, they are not only raising money for technology um, um, yeah, development, but also for, for the use case itself, like Vada, who are investing in, in a capsule and return capsule, but they are also producing their, their products. So um, this is also why we now invest in our products, so we want to speed up in, in, in creating success stories that we can help the complete market to, to grow. Because only if you have first success stories, first unicorns coming out of that, then you will get more investor money, more into it, and then all of the service providers, they will have a need to really yeah, serve for the customers coming. So I think this is very important to really close the business case that we get success stories on product development level and really on growing companies. Mm -hmm. Do we have a roving microphone from the technical team do we have the possibility for a roving microphone to the audience? <laughs> no, we don't. Okay, in which case, we do have a little bit more time. I have some questions, but I think the audience may have some questions. So if you just want to think of a question, I can, if you just stand up, introduce yourself, and say your question very loudly, I can, we can try to repeat the question in the answer so that the people online can hear what the question was, even though they won't be able to pick up your voice. Uh, on the live stream, but it might be nice. So while you're thinking of some questions you might want to ask, I just want to put to you, all of you can jump in with your answers, what can ESA do better? I think you might have some thoughts on that. <laughs> what could ESA do better? You can all, wh whoever, if you want to speak, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, maybe just to reverse the logic, we are talking about infrastructure, but let's go also to the supply chain side because many of the potential ESA members and, and companies can actually contribute to our platforms. Um, we need better sensors, we need space qualified um, material, we need um, a lot of lab components that are available on Earth but are still not space qualified. And I think that one of the things that we see with space agency, they are all constantly looking to um, increase TRL. Um, so if there are any suppliers that are looking for us as a customers, 
Um, we need more and more components to offer in return to, to our customers. That's a very good call to action there. Yes, Joshua. Uh, so for me, I, th I think the main thing is speed. Um, perhaps conversely to some of the other panelists, I actually think the gap between European and American institutional funding is a positive because you have to build a commercial case that much faster as a European entity in order to sustain yourself. You're focused on bigger and better and perhaps more prolific commercial use cases. But to, to, to highlight that speed, uh, the first proposal I ever did into the European Space Agency was for 15,000 euro. They took 11 months to get back to me and tell me no. By that point, I'd already secured 200k euro in a different program run by a different team at ESA, which we, we were able to succeed in in about six months. But six months is a long time for a startup. Uh, you want to say what the two programs were? Uh, yeah, uh, so the first one was a technology transfer program. Uh, and to be quite honest, by the time I received the no, I'd forgotten we'd done it. Uh, and the uh, first success we had with ESA was uh, GSTP, uh, which resolved in going through a different route, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, getting support of your national agency, and then taking that to an ESA technical team, getting their buy-in, uh, and then going through a full proposal with ESA. So for anybody listening who hasn't done this application procedure yet, any tips? <laughs> Be patient. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Any, any other uh, suggestions? Nelly? Uh, maybe uh, a little bit on the attitude to risk. If we are going to find unicorns, we need to, to chase in, in many directions. There's a, there's a little bit on the speed as well, but I think that both ESA and probably motivated by the member states, because I can see the, um, the, the same push from, from our member states in the UK, there is an obsession on return on investment. And the return investment has to come fast, and it has to be certain. So there is a, a big gap between trying to innovate and find unicorns where we don't know where they are, and guaranteeing that for each euro uh, invested, there will be four euros, five, six, seven, depending on who you're talking to, back within a year. So I think my message is, both for ESA and the member states that are funding those programs is, well, if you want big return, you need to take risk and you need to take diversified risk and you need not to restrict the risk to, to small startups. You also need to engage the whole supply chain, give them the means to invest in some, in some things that are uncertain. And I know for a fact, um, you know, from working with SSTL, which for SSTL, which is part of Airbus, that you do not get shareholder backing on uncertainty without backing of an institution. So it's a collective call for attitude change to risk. And, uh, and that's what I would like to, to see happening in the, in the near future. Very well put, Hilda. Yeah, I agree with already everything that has been said. So for us, it has been very important to have this based on a public-private partnership in the true sense. Um, I very much agree with what Nelly was saying of the anchor customer and the validity and the credibility uh, that that brings. Um, so I think where ESA um, can still make more use as anchor customer as a, uh, a loyal, frequent user. Um, so in that sense, I was very happy with um, the request for information for LEO, for low Earth orbit, that was um, sent uh, from ESA on how they envisage to uh, use services and implement their own uh, scientific uh, program through the use of services. I think that's very important. Um, and I think also, um, yeah, where I think we need to move from a, uh, in the space ecosystem, let's say, to move from a, a one user, um, one set of requirements, one technical setup, one launch type of idea, we need to move to uh, usage of services, usage of multi-user uh, capabilities, um, and that's a step uh, that I think is important to make now. Um, and the last thing, and it thanks to uh, what Chris was saying in terms of creating success stories, but I would make it even more broader. I think ESA, but together with all of us, with the big family, I would say, what is really important is that we enhance the, um, the common people awareness of what it brings to their lives, 
Um, I think people, when you ask them why space, they would talk about telecommunication, they would maybe know their GPS, but if you ask them, and microgravity, what does it bring? Well, my mom would still not, well, she's been trained well in the meantime, <laughs> but I think it's really important that all of our kids, and they, they hear it on school, they hear it in the media, um, and that they are engaged and taken along in, in the story and being part of that, and, and so that we build this next generation and the, aware, the awareness of, of the capacity and the, and the... Very well put, Hilda. We've got time for one or two questions from the audience. Does anybody in the audience have a question for our large panel here? Yes, please stand up and we can repeat the question. Direct your question to somebody. Oh, and you have a question. <laughs> Dancing in the back. We'll take the questions um, if, and we'll repeat the question. So do you, yes, please. Loud, loud, loud voice. You might need to come closer to the stage. I'm so sorry, we, we're finding it hard to hear you. Maybe, yeah, exactly. Ah, wonderful, exactly. Joshua is sharing ah, his okay, microphone. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rishabh and my background is biomedical engineer. I have a question for David, actually. Um, you are working in a bioreactor field. So my question is uh, how you see the application of bioreactors in food and energy sector and what are the technological readiness level for that? For an example, use space, uh, low Earth orbit, or something like those kind of stuff. Maybe it would be great to, to see those things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Should I? Yeah. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, I'm much more on the uh, bio, which can, is related with food and agriculture, rather than fuel or other material. Um, actually, we are uh, doing um, phase A study uh, together with ESA uh, to have the production of meat. Uh, there are also one with urea. Uh, yeah. So there are two uh, parallel studies um, on uh, the production of meat, uh, so cultivation of meat in space, which could be then a benefit uh, to have better processes on planet Earth, of course. Um, so, yes, there should be some research that can be done uh, on this kind uh, of uh, research field, uh, also on plant and uh, other uh, complex organisms uh, on board the International Space Station in terms of stress, oxidative, oxidative stress and things like that. And a lot have been done in the past. Uh, but yes, there can be done uh, something. And yeah, for the, the meat. Let's see what will happen. Any, I think we have a question here. If you'd like to jump up to Joshua's microphone. <laughs> that would, well, it's good for the people on the live stream to actually hear <laughs> what you're saying. <laughs> and introduce who you are. Sir. Thank you. Um, Alan Cross, um, STFC in the UK. I'm in charge of developing the northwest of England's space economy. Um, my question is, we've just heard that the ISS, um, after spending £150 billion pounds putting it up there, is going to be thrown away in 2030. We've heard a lot about the circular economy. Um, as providers of in-orbit services and servicing, would you agree that we might be better using it in a circular way, stripping it, selling it for parts as a source of solar panels, panelling, gold foil, so on and so forth, and how might that be achieved? Very good question. Ed Gillespie would be very happy. We can pass this back to Joshua. Who, who would you like to answer your question? <laughs> all and sundry. Go ahead, all and sundry. <laughs> uh, since you've got the microphone back, Joshua, why don't you begin? <laughs> So it's probably uh, a good thing that Space Forge is developing return from space technology to enable these sorts of things to occur. Really, I think it depends on the use case for those technologies. Um, you know, a lot of the equipment on the ISS is quite old. The orbit itself of the International Space Station is quite contaminated from all of its pr processes and procedures and things that it's been doing over the past 20 years. So I think, I think there is perhaps something to say for on-orbit recycling. Um, but I would say that I think, I think Safe disposal of spacecraft is one thing, i.e. burning it up in our atmosphere. But I don't think we, as, a, as an industry, actually recognize the damage we might be doing to Earth by doing that itself. 
leaving harmful aluminium oxide in the upper layers of our atmosphere, for example, which exacerbate greenhouse gas emissions and effects. For me, I think actually there's a real opportunity to sustainably return these things to Earth and recycle them properly, strip down, uh, and leverage even it at a base resource level compared to how we currently think about um, what we currently do with our spacecraft and, and enormous pieces of space infrastructure. Thank you, Joshua. Actually, the question is extremely relevant and, um, and really reflects, highlights what we've spoken about yesterday. Um, and I wanted to talk to, well, any of you, I mean, you can all jump in, but I, I know what you were saying, Christian, about uh, business plans. How important is it when you're, you're giving your business plan, which then turns to naught, <laughs> to have sustainability written into it nowadays? from scratch, because we spoke about this a lot yesterday, and space being that perfect environment, and of course, you know, with all the UN rules, etc., we have to keep it a pristine place, there are regulations in place. How important is it to write that into your business plan and to adhere to it? Yeah, I think it's, it's key, but not in this, again, not in a direct sense. I mean, the ISS in total is a very sustainable way of using low Earth orbit because um, everything is packaged sort of with high efficiency into single launchers. We don't have a world of multiple micro launchers that are produced worldwide and supply the station or do whatever they do with multiple satellites. No, we have one station, one to take care of, one that can be refurbished, can be uh, so, uh, can be, yeah, be taken care of over time. This is really something, this is sustainable. It reduces at the end the, uh, the, the total amount of investment and resources. Money is always resources uh, that, we, that we put into and is required to sustain it. And then also part of the sustainability aspect is, uh, and that's not been addressed very much, education. And I mean, how boring is space if nobody can see what the satellite can see? I mean, uh, and this is something you have to inspire people, you have to bring them to a certain understanding. It started with, in the Soviet uh, uh, space program uh, and the Americans when they first saw uh, the Earth. And it, it was kind of the trigger point for, for peace at the end. And here is the pr trigger point to take care of the Earth. Uh, as we heard yesterday from Ed, you have to love the Earth. And how, I mean, this view, if you, if you democratize this view, if you do it in ways that we can bring it to mass in a commercial way, then you have also a contribution to sustainability because people will understand more and more what it means, what we are doing, and how it has impact. Mm -hmm. So I see... Um, these two aspects. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and to answer his direct, sorry, I've forgotten your name? Al. Al. To answer Al's question, which is quite specific, what do you think on that point? You have to re repeat the point. I didn't get it completely when you were speaking. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, ah, yes, okay. Yes, I thought about that when I was looking upwards. Yes, in, in part yes, uh, and in part no. Uh, the, the issue is the structural one, because at some point it will just break. Uh, there are fractures already in the Russian segment, and that part will have to be discarded. But there are plans, and I cannot say more, to give it a second life, part of it. Uh, I mean, Axiom, that's no secret. Axiom is building something, and then you can hook up to Axiom or reconfigure. Yes, of course, but it has limitations because the lifetime is at some point limited. So in short, yes, but no. There's yeah. your answer, Al. Yeah. Uh, my, uh, my <laughs> yes. it's, like a Cuban, it's like a Cuban uh, a vehicle uh, that <laughs> runs for 70 years. At some point, yeah. I'll come back to you, Hilda, but yes, Christian, yes, One, yes, one comment for, for the question about sustainability yes. in a business case. I think you should not just implement sustainability in your idea because of a business plan and maybe you have more chances to get investor money. It should be really a value and a value of your company that now, if you're developing technology, they should be sustainable and should be like uh, climate friendly and everything because that's your value and your company value. So it should not be just a trigger to, to, to raise more money. So I think this is a very important topic which had, had to come from, you know, from your heart and really you have to, to stand behind it because then if you are convinced, then 
you have the sustainability, like we refurbish all our hardware, we are building now the science taxi, which will not be permanently on ISS, but will be come back um, always, which of course increases the, the, the mass to go to orbit and back, but as we have more and more good technologies to, to access space and to return from space, I think this is also a sustainability we, we can guarantee for our customers, and which is very important for us, not only that the things getting old because they are 20 years in, in space, because we can refurbish them on Earth and keep them like on, on the edge of technology. So. Well, it's wonderful if your company has it as a value, but sometimes the nudge effect comes into play where if people require it, it helps force the issue as well. Hilda, you wanted to comment. Yeah, and it might be to the frustration of the, of the question asker because I'm also <laughs> not the expert on talking on the technical recycling part. But for me, the, the main thing ISS has brought is it's a fantastic international uh, endeavor, a technical endeavor, and it, it brought a whole, or it, it built a whole ecosystem, I mean, uh, around the world. And I think it's really, we, we should look at it, uh, not necessarily how we recycle the technical, uh, the physical uh, infrastructure part, but really ask, like, what are the main assets uh, and, and uh, strengths that the ISS has brought? And that's this international uh, global ecosystem <coughs> and these assets that we can uh, access to, like uh, microgravity, and I think it's hugely important that we show not only how we are avoiding to create debris in, in space, or not only how we are um, uh, staying neutral with respect to sustainability, but that we very much uh, integrate this, uh, uh, for example, the food, how, I mean, how can we um, <clears throat> bring the assets of space into a food uh, chain uh, that is sustainable, I think it's hugely important. And that's, I think, what we need to uh, recycle. Sounds a bit <laughs> even negative, but that we should really highlight and take from the ISS uh, in the future. Thank you. Uh, yes. I, I would like to add one more um, perspective. So, so recycling is, for me, and again, given my background, part of in-orbit servicing. Um, which I think is critical to the success of um, our business. And it also goes to show how ESA, but also us, um, are separating between capabilities. Um, so, for example, there, there is a separate workshop later this day about in-orbit servicing. And we should start thinking about applications. And now all of the different capabilities serve the same application rather than, okay, we have in-orbit servicing and then we have manufacturing, we have microgravity, etc. It's all going to serve the same customer in the end and we need to start thinking about how to unify all these vectors to the same target. Yes, just a final question because we are the last thing before... Oh, well, okay, yes, we'll, we'll take the final question from the audience. So, Joshua, if you could, could kindly give this lady your microphone, thank you very much. Hello, and thank you. So, introduce yourself. Yes, uh, I'm Emma, and I work for Vertigo, which is a 3D printing company that works with concrete, so with robotic arms. Uh, and my question is, if you are uh, knowledgeable of uh, in particular towards additive manufacturing, if there is research done in microgravity that serves also applications for space, so on the moon or Mars, uh, because uh, a lot of the applications that are done in microgravity well, serve at the moment what we're doing on Earth, so I was wondering if there's also any attempt or any benefit from them towards uh, space missions on Mars or, or moon. And that question seems to be directed to one of you. are looking directly at Joshua. And, and <laughs> is there anybody in particular you would like to direct the question to on our panel? Not in particular. Okay, who would like to take this question? Uh, as somebody Joshua who, again. As somebody <laughs> that's developing such payload technology. Yes. Um, yes, there is. Um, primarily, it comes down to the ability to create new types of alloys in, in the space environment. Um, I mean, it's really interesting, you know, today we've only really spoken about microgravity, but we haven't mentioned the other benefits of the space environment. Uh, primarily high purity vacuum and the fact that you can access plus or minus 250 Celsius, just depending on which way your platform is orientated. Across those three benefits, you can create uh, new types of alloys which are much purer, much stronger, uh, and much more complex than you can on Earth. Now, though, that does have utility on the moon and, and on Mars for bases and, and so forth, um, which is really cool. However, there's no economy. The demand for Mars bases, for lunar things, is institutionally government-led. 
um, initiatives. And I think we have to be really careful about that. And actually, calling things a lunar economy is a false, is, is a false dichotomy, because there isn't one. It, it's about government money, government spend. And exploration, for exploration's sake, is important. But I think, really, if we can't, if we can't drive home that the benefits that space can create on our home planet, then I think we as an industry are failing. Uh, and kind of, go, I guess, to loop back to some of those, uh, those earlier points. For me, if sustainability is not at the top of the pyramid about what you do, then I think you've already failed. Because if you're not planning that in your, in your business plan over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, then the next generations that come after us aren't even going to see it. It's a, a wonderful and sobering final moment. Well, we've got so many experts here on the panel with a huge amount of varied experience. It's now time for the coffee break, which I'm sure you're all dying to have. It's all set up here by our wonderful catering staff. So do enjoy a coffee break. Do enjoy your networking. And we'll start again at 11.30. But please thank our fantastic panel. <laughs> oh,